Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, today uh, I'm Liz Kelleher here uh, with the Udacity team working to develop uh, our Data Analyst Nano Degree, which uh, actually launches in four days on Monday. But we're, we're here to talk about how data science will power the future. And I have two people with me that can help us do just that. So I have Sebastian Thrun, CEO and founder, actually uh, here at the Udacity team. He also is a research professor at Stanford. Uh, was vice president at Google uh, and founded the Google X team, uh, which brought us such things as the self-driving car, uh, which everyone uh, is uh, excited about, and Google Glass, uh, among a lot of other innovative projects. And also with me, I have Nitin Sharma, VP of Engineering and Data Science here at Udacity as well. Uh, Nitin's had a, a really amazing career uh, helping shape the successful business strategies of companies like Google and Groupon and Yahoo by analyzing the behavior patterns of hundreds of thousands of people. So who better to talk to us about uh, how data science will power the future than Sebastian and Nitin. So uh, we should probably um, first kind of uh, think about our audience. We might have people tuning in who just want to learn a little bit more about data science in general, people who are excited to get into this field, and others who might be on the fence and not sure if it's the right thing for them. Um, so let's talk about some things that might help them shape their, their decisions. Great. First of all, we might want to start with uh, what is data science? Uh, this is a term we hear a lot lately, and let's kind of set the stage with what is data science? So to my mind, data science is uh, the science of systematically discovering patterns in very large data sets uh, to extract knowledge and to predict, to extract useful knowledge and to predict something of value. And to do that systematically, rigorously, is what data science uh, discipline is about. Yeah, there's been a, an explosion of uh, data available. It's exponentially growing. It's also an explosion of machine power available. And as a result, data has become the future of pretty much every business, and it's the future of artificial intelligence. It's very, very big. Great. Great. So, uh, great, great, great background for everyone. Um, but here we are in the offices in the middle of uh, Mountain View, kind of smack in the middle of uh, Silicon Valley. There's a lot going on around us. Um, so maybe you can uh, hear a little bit about what the exciting opportunities are, what, what kind of projects are out there, what could people get involved with if data science actually happening today? So I mean the valley is kind of booming in data science right now and there's tons of open jobs. In fact, data science, data analysts are in extremely short demand. Um, examples, Netflix, your movie recommendation are based on data science. And Google, your search results and your predictions are based on data science. Pretty much every company here right now has a major data science branch, including the self-driving car. It's uh, built on, on data science. And there are lots of other uh, cool projects that are happening in practically every possible industry, be it health and finance and retail um, and uh, meteorology and weather prediction, uh, all sorts of areas. Uh, IBM uh, has worked on uh, Watson as a very cool question answering uh, uh, system that has won Jeopardy and beaten the, beaten the world champion for, uh, in Jeopardy and now they are using it to answer and do my, my medical diagnostics. In the world of genetics, uh, we are analyzing human genome data to figure out which, uh, uh, which uh, people are more susceptible to contracting certain kinds of disease. Uh, in, in the world of meteorology, uh, weather predictions. And uh, there's hardly any field today that is not touched, that is not being transformed by the availability of data and finding interesting insights from that data. So they're really amazing things happening kind of all over, uh, including the company that sends me uh, clothes every month that seems to kind of know what I like and how I like to dress. And you're doing a great job. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so uh, there's a lot to be excited about getting involved in, uh, but I think one of the really important questions people might want to know the answer to is, is there an opportunity for people to get into this field? Are there more jobs available, or is it hard to, to get it? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you right now, um, we have openings at Udacity. Um, Google has openings. All the companies I know about uh, are really desperate to find more data scientists and data engineers. Um, there's a mismatch. Uh, the data thing is kind of new and the tools you need to understand are very, very recent. 
Um, statistics is old, but data science as a kind of a practical field is very new. And what you learn at colleges is actually not that new, right? So most professors have been around for a decade or so and don't quite know. I think there's one PhD program in the nation on machine learning. It's a Carnegie Mellon University. So there's a really shortage of like trained people in the data science space and an enormous demand. I think I talked to Pladera, one of our partners recently, and for their data science certificate, they believe that the entry level salaries are north of three hundred thousand dollars a year. Wow! Wow! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. wow. What do you think? <laughs> so uh, I, I think the 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 world is just exploding with data, be it through you know uh, internet usage, uh, people using mobile phones, and sensor networks collecting a lot of data. Uh, and our ability to analyze the data is not scaling because people don't have the right skills today to analyze and make sense of that data because many of the academic programs are not keeping up, uh, keeping pace with the explosion in data. I read a statistic somewhere. Uh, it was based on an IDC study that 90% of all the data that humankind has generated has, gen has been generated in the last two years. And that, that trend is going to continue for another at least 20, 30, 50 years. And yet, our ability to scale, uh, the ability to analyze the data at that scale is not keeping up. So we need people with the right skills, with the right techniques, and the right training to be able to make sense of that data and get useful information. And the cool thing is not, it's not rocket science, right? So you can actually learn it, it turns out. So if you are a systems engineer or a software engineer or a high school teacher, or whatever you are, I mean, it's not, I mean, we just have to understand and know it. Right, so great news uh, for people that are, are looking to get into the industry and, and get a job here. There's exponential opportunity comparatively to the people that are right now uh, able to fill those uh, positions and opportunities. That's, that's definitely good news. Um, well, some people watching uh, may be looking to get a job with a company, um, but some others may be interested in becoming an entrepreneur. And are there opportunities in uh, the field for people that want to start their own gig instead of working for someone else? I, I can tell you, I mean, if you want to start a company in Silicon Valley in the tech field, uh, you very likely will hire yourself a lot of data scientists. And the reason is, no matter what you do, whether it's oil drilling or it's, uh, I don't know, medical space where you do personalized medicine, in the end of the day, data will be over can be the strongest trait. And uh, the companies that really understood this early on were companies like Google, which started data science at a, at a scale much bigger and grander than anybody else. And as a result, produced much better search results, which gave them superiority in, in the business field. Amazon.com, um, they do amazing data science, not just in the uh, product uh, selection, but also in the layout of the screen. The entire screen that you see is optimized to basically convert you and make you buy something. Um, I think that that trend from these Formerly small companies, now big companies, is, is accelerating. So if you start a company today and you don't do good data work, you're likely going to fall behind. And the same is true for us. If you ask it, if we have a data team and we have an amazingly great engineering VP running it, who's <laughs> world-class data scientist, and um, and it makes all the difference in understanding our customer works, our student works, our content works, and so on. And we're leveraging this massively in making our education better. So, so it definitely sounds like if you, if you want to be uh, an entrepreneur in this area, you need a uh, very talented quality data scientist. Um, so actually, speaking of that, I recently heard that the Harvard Business Review called data scientists the sexiest job of the 21st yes, century. Yes, they're referring to you. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what do you think about that? Uh, what is, why do you think they're calling it that? I think it's right on because the amount of insight that is hidden in the data is so powerful that it can make the difference between a dramatically successful company and an average company. And uh, the companies that are on top of the data on what their customers are doing, what they need, what they want, what do they not, not like, what are they liking, any company that is on top of these trends is, has a dramatically powerful uh, advantage that can just completely uh, overwhelm uh, all their competitors. So. It is the equivalent of fighting uh, a war with nuclear weapons versus the other guys fighting with bows and arrows. That's how powerful data science can be. Uh, in, in it doesn't make it sexy, though. <laughs> <laughs> you can be, you know, the, the data science ninjas can really, you know, help you win wars. Ninjas, ninjas. Okay. Pretty good. Um, absolutely. So, I mean, it sounds like if you are this person in the organization or a part of this team in the organization, you're kind of the go-to person, you know, to help feel these things. Um, like I mean, just to show how powerful that. it is, the, the human genome 
right, fits on a very small thumb drive. That's basically what it takes to decode our own genome. And the, the beauty of us is actually not just the genome, it's actually the data. And we learn, we spend the first kind of couple of years doing basically nothing, um, like dabbling around and learning how to speak and looking at other stuff. And I would argue that the vast majority of intelligence is actually our cumulative data, it's not the human genome. Um, and the same is true for machines. I mean, machines are um, amazingly powerful these days, and you feed them with data. We have really amazing advances in the field. We have this thing called deep leave networks and so on that can accumulate a lot of data and really understand data at a much deeper level than even three years ago. And that's really a game changer. Sounds like it. Absolutely. So um, now that we know that it's a very sexy job, what characteristics and qualities, though, if we kind of drill down into what do people need to uh, kind of have in their uh, personality and, and skills, really, to be able to be successful? Sure, that's a great question. I can start off, and then, Sebastian, you can say whether you agree with me or you have things <laughs> to add to that. So, yes, data. <laughs> so one thing is, I think it's very important for you to have a solid background in probability and statistics and have a solid understanding of the data mining techniques and algorithms to analyze data at scale. Uh, so that's the, you know, uh, and with special emphasis on the strengths and weakness of each approach. In what scenario is a decision tree a good way to uh, uh, build a predictive model? When is logistic regression a, a better algorithm? When is, uh, uh, when is support vector machines the right uh, tool to use? So having a good understanding of the trade-offs uh, and the strength and weaknesses is very important. Uh, second thing I would say is uh, the right skills to process data at very large scale. Typically, we are talking about terabytes or more of data. So you know you have to have a very good understanding of what it takes to build software that will handle the data at that scale. Uh, be aware of the practical considerations of you know. Uh, things like outliers or filters or noise in the data, missing data, incorrect values, and being able to handle uh, these cases efficiently. And third thing I would say is general curiosity and the ability to ask the right questions, understanding the business context in which these problems appear, uh, figure out what is the right solution, uh, what is the right way to solve that problem, and equally importantly, communicate the findings to the business audience so that they can make the best de de decisions based on that data. I think that was perfect. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I, agree. I mean, the, the, the only thing I would add is, and first of all, I think there's many different levels of data scientists, right? There's the PhD level, which people have invent new things, and new theories, and then there's more the, the technician level, where people are able to handle these things and do a good job, but they're not going to come with new theory. And I think all of them are important. At the bottom, there's many more jobs than at the top. It takes you longer to get to the top. Um, at any level, you also need to understand tools. Like yeah. there's a ton of tools in the industry that people use. If you invent everything from scratch, you're going to spend a lot of time. So we have tools from Cloudera and MongoDB and, and many other companies in our repertoire that are really contemporary that you have to understand. Yeah. One of the questions that we often get asked is, well, what is the difference between a data scientist, a data analyst, and a data engineer? And I think Sebastian just answered that question. Yeah, the scientist for me is the person who kind of invents the new crazy stuff. And I mean, I have a PhD, so I might be in the category or have been in the past. Um, but but much more our data analyst kind of work that we are we are launching uh, is is much more uh, at a lower level, but at a much more broader level uh, with many more jobs, uh, which is really being able to do uh, meaningful work with data, with existing tools. Um, so that's basically where we can get you really easily. Absolutely. So. So speaking of that, as so we mentioned in the beginning, we're really excited here at UDAS to be launching our data analyst and degree in four days. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about why is uh, that the right place uh, to start? Why is it the right, the, the right thing for people to do? Well, it's your first step into the wonderful kingdom of, of data science. Um, you get to learn all the important tools. You get a solid grounding in statistics and probability. You get programming experience. And you get to a point where you're completely employable in Silicon Valley uh, and, and around the world. So I think it's a, the perfect first step. If you like what you do, um, there's more steps to, to go up to. But it's a fantastic way to get into the field. And it's very little commitment. It's inexpensive. It's fast. Um, so it's much cheaper than getting a degree from university. And the way we have designed this program is to, uh, to come up with a very compact plan to get all the right skills that are needed to become an effective data analyst. And uh, this is a program that we have worked on making sure that uh, all the concepts that are required are 
uh, taught rigorously. It is based on uh, a pedagogy that is rooted in learning by doing, very hands-on, uh, where you are actually going to be developing uh, projects on based on real-world situations with real data and showcase uh, uh, and complete the project and showcase it uh, uh, as a proof of your competence or the skills that you have learned. Yeah, so it's very mean? practically oriented, uh, really designed to make you successful as a data analyst in the out in the real world. And what's really unique about Udacity, I mean, there's many different places where you can get kind of data science education, is we really work uh, with the top companies here in Silicon Valley. So we have like Facebook and Google and these companies they tell us what they want. So we ask them the question, like, what do you want your employees, your current and future employees to know? And they work and build their material with us. And that's very unique for Elasticity that we are, have this very, very strong educational alliance with these wonderful, wonderful companies. So, and affordable, as you mentioned, as well. Right. And this program, as I said, is built with the experts in, in, the, in the field with a very practical orientation towards what it takes to succeed, not just academically, but in real world places. Yeah, I mean, at t who's sponsoring this um, uh, and working with us and giving us the top experts, um, they have reserved jobs for this. So um, if you take that nano degree, uh, send us the application. <laughs> Fantastic. It's a ringing endorsement right, right there. So, you know, really much uh, different and maybe much more relevant uh, today uh, than um, paying a lot more money going through traditional education experience, which may not have the relevant uh, skills that you need to know like right now, coming straight from the employers that I would like to work for. Um, that's, that's really exciting. Um, so with that in mind, uh, here at Udacity, uh, you know, we're really well known for our courses, but some folks watching might uh, need a little bit of an uh, explanation between what the difference is between taking a Udacity course and getting a Udacity nano degree. Well, the nano degree is kind of the accumulation of, of our work to really create a, a credential that industry accepts. And we now have north of 30 companies that are strongly endorsing it, building the content with us, and accepting those as a, as a first grade credential. And, and it's a new credential. I mean, it, this doesn't match any academic credential you're aware of. It's actually much shorter. Um, we believe the world is becoming faster and shorter. And we see this from email to Twitter. So we're kind of the Twitter of all degrees now. Um, but it's very accessible. And it's really accepted and built by industry. Um, so it's, uh, it's really something that, I mean, the companies in Silicon Valley put their weight behind and their name behind and their trust in and something that I believe will become an industry standard, to be honest. That's really, really exciting. Uh, so um, we've had a lot of questions coming in from uh, the audience. So uh, maybe we can take a look at some of those. Uh, sure. sure. All right. So um, one, of, one of the questions that came in today uh, was uh, about kind of maybe we could recommend for a traditional software development team, including data scientists, that want us to um, evolve towards a more uh, data-driven product. They want to. They want to evolve in that direction. Maybe you can share some advice. Sure, that. that's a great. You question. just done it <laughs> for us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. so, so I think uh, what is uh, important is to pay attention to uh, to build the applications with scale in mind from the get-go because the data is growing very rapidly and you, you have to be able to design the algorithms and the applications with a with scale in mind. So you have to make sure that the, the application is robust. It is, uh, you know, it is robust towards potential, uh, you know, outliers or missing data or, uh, you know, potential corruption in data. So you know, you, you, uh, the, uh, the applications that you develop uh, have to uh, deal with scale, failures, and potential uh, missing values and so on. And uh, uh, these applications uh, would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, they need to tackle the business problems uh, as opposed to just implementing cool algorithms for the sake of it. So you have to know yeah. why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. Right. And at top of it, I would say it's a cultural issue. Right? So in Silicon Valley, we're all data-driven. Uh, we're all very young. If you go to companies that are established and have been around before this data science wave, AKA in 2005 or 1900, late 1900s, um, there's usually this, uh, this scene that, that there's a lot of opinions and usually very little data because the tools didn't exist. Um, so to get a team to be really data-centric, I think you have to really kind of work also on management, mid-level management, and engineers to really accept data. Once you get to the point where data is accepted, where you share data, 
a lot of opinions go away and are replaced by data. And I find this extremely refreshing. So we, when we look at our content, we don't argue about opinions. We just look at the data. And that really helps us set the development schedule for our, for our products. Great. Sounds like you can really add very important value to the direction of, of the company. Um, absolutely. So, so this kind of goes along the same lines, though. Um, so somebody asked, uh, with this you know, prevalence of big data, um, and what are the risks of uh, you know, maybe having uh, five different data scientists finding five different results um, from the data? Uh, how do you mitigate for that, or, or what are your thoughts on, on that? So uh, if, the, if the, uh, the techniques used are, uh, are rigorous, then probably they will not be uh, uncovering insights that are in conflict with each other. Uh, so that's the first part. The second part is that if these five data scientists are looking at five different aspects of the problem, then it makes the solution all the more richer. So there is not necessarily inherently a conflict uh, as long as you follow the right uh, rigorous techniques. And you know, five people looking at the problem in different ways might actually come up with more insights that are that help you understand the problem and the solutions in a much more uh, interesting way. And I would argue, I mean, my experience when I, when I do data, the, the more common situation is not that we have five data scientists with five different opinions, is that I have a data science group that completely blows me away. Um, when we built the self-driving car, uh, we drove it every day. We had dozens of them every day to the present day, um, driving around the Bay Area. And the type of problems that occurred in the data were massively different from anything I could have imagined. Uh, and it was only the data that helped us understand what the actual deficiencies were and helped us really shape the development. Yeah, and it kind of sounds a lot like what you were talking about before, where the difference between kind of using your opinions and, and ideas instead of really digging into the data and see what it tells you. Uh, and you actually yes. mentioned in, uh, the other day to me about um, how we ended up with a search bar in the middle of the screen uh, for, for Right, so yeah, so uh, data can help you understand uh, patterns of usage that uh, can be something that is very hard to guess. So uh, an example, this is maybe even a decade ago when I was at Yahoo, uh, we were looking at how users use the Yahoo homepage, and we discovered a very interesting pattern in the data that back then, next users were using search more often on the Yahoo homepage compared to Internet Explorer users. And interestingly, back then, the search box was centered for Netscape users, and it was left adjusted for IE users. So based on that, we hypothesized that maybe it is the centering that is getting people to search more. And we tested this you know, with 20 different versions of the homepage in an A-B testing framework, and we found that the only thing that made the difference was centering. And with that change, literally overnight, Yahoo search share grew by a few percentage points. Yeah, and I mean, sometimes talking billions of dollars, it's and, amazing. Right, and it you know, led to uh, tens of millions of dollars of incremental revenue, and I can't think of any easier way to make tens of millions of dollars for a company. It's incredible. So, uh, so uh, somebody else asked, uh, you know, this is really exciting, uh, but they're curious, is, is this a trend? So, so everybody's talking about it right now. Are we concerned that this you know, big trend will kind of fade out, or what do you think the, the lifespan of this Incredible well, isn't, isn't everything a trend? Um, I, I, I'd say that this is going to be with us for quite a while. In fact, we're seeing this exponential uptake right now. It's, it's quite massive. And um, we see an ability to collect data that's going up exponentially, an ability to process data going exponentially. And we see the resulting benefits to go up exponentially, to be honest. So I think we're going to be on it for quite a while. And I actually think that this is just the very beginning, the very first few years of, this, of a trend that is likely to continue for several decades. The data is just exploding, as we mentioned uh, earlier, and uh, the, the range of things that we can discover, uncover from the data, the kinds of insights, uh, are just so powerful that I can't imagine any business in another decade from now operating without a very strong data scientist, uh, scientist team. It is simply not possible to compete in the modern world if you don't have, uh, you, if you're not on top of the data about your customers, about your business, and uh, how your uh, your customers are interacting with your product or service. So uh, that kind of leads us into another question that, that was asked. Uh, given um, that we know this is a very fruitful industry, what what do you think? You mentioned earlier all a lot of different opportunities in a lot of different fields, but in the next five to ten years, what do you think will be kind of the biggest 
uh, things that, that come out of this field uh, specifically? Do you have a, a sense for where you think we're going in the next five to ten years? I mean, obviously, what we're doing today is we optimize like crazy everything we do. So um, if you have a product in the market, you have to, to apply data to make it really good. Um, but I think that the next step is actually um, we're going from very targeted structured data questions where you have a clear input and a clear output to very amorphous and broad data questions. There's a lot of work on, on data processing technology that has like millions of all parameters, like deep belief networks is one that's very popular these days. And I think that's going to uh, massively um, kind of take over the world. There's going to be all kinds of jobs that will be empowered by, um, by an ability to have a level of intelligence that, that is much stronger than we've ever seen before. So, so right now we, we can uh, fly planes autonom autonomously, we can drive cars autonomously, so we, we've done away with that. Um, the next thing to fall might be, I don't know, software engineers, um, a whole bunch of areas, I think, admins, where we can use data science um, to really boost the intelligence of our computers. Right. And I feel that uh, the, the next several years are going to uh, lead to a much more richer and much more uh, diverse data sets, uh, you know, images and, uh, you know, uh, events from sensor networks, uh, text and video. And, you know, the world is just exploding uh, with all sorts of data that uh, will open up possibilities that we can't even imagine today. Yeah. And I mean, people uh, talk about artificial intelligence a lot. Like, you know, must just warn against it. That's data. I mean, what is happening in AI right now is all about machine learning. It's all about data. So if, you, if we just test 10 years from now, the tools, the skills you're going to pick up in data will be essential to make machines truly intelligent. That's amazing. Very exciting things to come. Um, so we have a couple more questions coming in. Uh, a lot of people watching are very interested in getting a job uh, in this area. and um, somebody asked specifically, um, you know, they, they look at job opportunities uh, for companies out there and uh, almost all of them uh, say you need relevant work, work experience, three to five years uh, work experience. What is your suggestion for someone uh, that doesn't have that work experience, but maybe they do have the basic skills? Uh, what do you think that they should do? I mean, the way you get work experience is that you work, right? So um, it's actually not true that you have to have work experience to find a job, otherwise none of us would ever have a job. <laughs> so. Um, the, the degree that you'd be offering the nano degree is really perfectly suited for someone to get their first job in the field. And maybe you come in with different work experience, maybe you've been a software engineer before, you become a data analyst and you leverage this. Maybe you're completely new, you're an English major or, or what have you, and it's your first kind of foray into computer science. Um, either way, um, th there's, there's going to be jobs waiting for you because there's such a demand right now. And uh, yes, experience is important. I think it's, it's important to take what you do into the field. We do as good a job, I think, as you can do in terms of learning by doing and, and getting experience in our educational context that we offer, but we're not offering three to five years of work experience. Um, so that's something that I would recommend taking another degree, find this every first job, and apply what you learn, improve your skills, sharpen your axe, and then go from there. The sky is the limit. Yeah. And to add to what Sebastian just said, uh, we, are, we have explicitly designed the nano degree to uh, have our projects be based on real-world uh, problems with real data so that you get uh, uh, experience working with uh, real data sets that approximates the world situ uh, real work situations as uh, closely as possible so that you get a feel for what kind of problems uh, to work on and what are the constraints, what are the limitations. And when you complete these projects, they can be the showcase of the skills or competence that you have learned. Yeah. So that will give you an edge, uh, even if you don't have a three or a five year uh, work experience. And as Sebastian said, that is not the only thing that matters because otherwise we would never have gotten our first job. Uh, but you know, to give these practical experiences yeah. is what this nano degree is. And about. we get we get this data from our partner companies, right? These are the companies that want to hire you, right? So they say, look, if you can solve this problem here, then we believe you're at the caliber where we'd love to hire you. So you're not just fake, randomly created artificial things. They're real. Well, that's amazing. So you can take this portfolio that you have, really, to demonstrate uh, your, your skills and what you're able to do. And you don't have to, you know, three to five years in a job. It doesn't necessarily have to be. I mean, a little plug here from a machine learning class. The data set you were dealing with is <laughs> going to be the Enron data. Enron is a company that went bust a few years ago. And the entire email conversation has been made public. And it's become the reference data set for understanding fraud and text learning and so on. 
and it's exactly the type data that people internally use for fraud detection inside companies and for finding any criminal behavior and so on and analyzing email. Um, there might just be one specific aspect, but it's the kind of data that our partner companies would love you to be able to master, and you can you can learn that now. And more and more companies uh, and government institutions uh, are uh, making their data sets available for anybody out in the world to analyze and uh, you know uh, find interesting patterns. Netflix has uh, uh, a, a data set about its users and its preferences for their preferences for certain movies and so on. Uh, CDC, uh, the Center for Disease Control, they have, uh, I believe, released some data. And more and more companies, more and more organizations are making available these data sets for anybody out there to analyze. I, I actually remember as an elementary school teacher, we would do uh, work really hard in the area of STEM. That's a big area right now. And you would get real world problems. You would connect with somebody in industry and then pose a problem. Yeah. And second graders are working on how we can solve the problem of not having enough water in different countries. And, and so it's a really exciting time to be in that you're able to interact with this data specifically and work on problems and, and not have to wait to be in a company yeah. or someone to assign you that role. I mean, it's a cool thing. I mean, if I brag about a little bit of ourselves here, um, of Udacity because we have this very strong industry alliance. We get companies like Google and, and, and Cloudera and Facebook to kind of give us their problems. And I believe it's relevant because these companies know what they want, right? It's not that I sit in the corner and think about it and become a professor and do this for 30 years, and it's really kind of grounded in practice. Okay, um, so we do have a couple more questions coming in. Uh, one specifically wants to know, what are, what are the programming languages? So if we get a little bit more specific, what, what programming languages should they start learning uh, to get into this field? So it is more about the uh, about the, uh, the foundational techniques and algorithms, but uh, there are a few uh, programming uh, languages that are getting uh, very popular. Python and R are, are probably two of the biggest examples. Uh, and I guess what we teach them. <laughs> <laughs> and I would suggest for uh, someone who is new to the field to focus probably most on these two languages. Yeah. So, so Python and R. I'd also say that there's a whole bunch of tools the industry uses, like I don't know, MapReduce and so on for scale that you have to just know. Um, so we've been working with um, Cloudera and Hadoop and so on to, to, to teach those skills and on top of the programming languages, right? Because these tools are pre-coded tools to take your idea up to scale. And, and actually, as Sebastian mentioned earlier, one of the courses that's included in, uh, the project that's included in the nano degree that's going live on Monday is uh, Intro to Machine Learning, uh, which uh, you are an instructor in. I'm a co-instructor. Co co-instructor, <laughs> that's right, um, absolutely. So uh, it'll be uh, really the nano degree has been designed to, to prepare folks uh, to not only kind of gain the skills, but then present them, have a portfolio yeah. to offer. For and the way to think about this, I mean, we're, not, we're not trying to do it with college. We're not saying when you are like, you know, 16, 17 years old, you, you, we, we do a little arts, whatever, uh, critical thinking education. We really want to get you to the type of skills needed in Silicon Valley as fast as possible. So we're really focusing on one thing, which is how do we turn you into a data analyst? Um, so if you are smart um, and, 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 and ambitious and, 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 and willing to work, um, it's, it's some work, of course, involved. We, we can turn you into a very high level person. You can do that in of your own home, on, yeah. your, on your couch. Yeah, you can learn in your bedroom. You can learn in your bathroom, <laughs> <laughs> on your train. And at your own pace. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. So, so a few, few more things, things uh, here. So, so um, considering all the technologies which have been kept, uh, kind of, we've been kept abreast with, uh, how much of a data scientist's job is figuring out which of those technologies to use at a company? versus uh, opposed to analyzing the data itself. And Nitin, you may have talked about a little bit about this earlier. Yes, so I, I think most of the uh, emphasis should be on understanding the problem domain and the structure and what techniques would best apply to solve the problem, and not as much on the choice of the programming language. Uh, I would say the biggest uh, uh, decision that you probably have to make is, what kind of algorithms to use and what are the features that you need to put in your uh, prediction model. That, uh, that is the most important decision to make rather than the specific choice of the language. Okay. Yeah, and I would argue, I mean, when you get in and you have your job in the data, data analyst, uh, the number one frustration will be that the tools you've learned about aren't a great fit for the problems you really want to solve. Like, That's very often you want to ask a question and the tools don't really let you ask this question. So the data might be changing over time, have missing features, and so on. 
So the, the skill of taking something in the real world you care about and then take this toolbox over here, whichever language it is, and make those match, that's the most important skill. So that's the number one source of frustration, to be honest, because uh, in class, you'll find that these things are very, very great because the instructors chose problems that look really compliant. But in the real world, as you go into our project phase and now another degree, you'll find it's really hard sometimes to make this connection. And right. that's what you want to learn. So you need to be adaptive. Yeah, that's right. To be able to, yeah. to try but, the first thing. And no fear, it's completely masterable. And these, these are the kinds of issues that you will uh, deal with hands-on as you go through some of our projects. Yeah, so you learn that. Um. Great. Well, speaking of uh, nano degree specifically, um, someone asked, is it appropriate for someone with significant experience in software development? Many of the data science programs we've seen in the past seem to be aimed for someone who is brand new to program. program. Well, here's a cool thing. You can go your own pace, and you can go as fast as you want, right? So we don't force, like normally in education, there's something called seed time. The, the way you get credentials in academia is you have to take a certain number of hours. In our case, we don't care. We care that you are skilled, that you can do it, that you have the mastery of the material. So if you are an experienced programmer, please come to us. Um, you'll be much, much faster. And you can bree breeze through the parts which uh, require, uh, you know, software uh, experience or building large-scale data applications. Uh, if you are already strong in probability and statistics, you can skip those parts and focus more on the software development. So basically, whatever skills you already have, you don't need to go through all of them uh, because our programs are designed to be flexible. Yeah, we you can, can focus only on the things, only on the topics or concepts that you need to learn and uh, uh, develop expertise in. It was interesting. We launched in another degree a little bit earlier, and we had the first five weeks carved out, but we leave for five weeks, and a whole bunch of students came back after 24 hours and had to solve all this. <laughs> and it's obviously they didn't learn anything from scratch. They really knew a lot of stuff in advance. But the, the nice thing about the online world and about our programs is they really afford to the flexibility. And hopefully, I mean, we believe you spend your time wisely if you follow that. Right, and really, really good education is individualized, is personalized. People can kind of start where they are and move forward. Um, so, so that's great. Um, so, a couple more things here. Um, so, someone, someone's asking, they're, they're excited about the NANO degree, and, and they're just concerned, is, are the projects enough to show the companies that they're qualified? Um, uh, is this something that if they put it in front of an employer, you think it's going to have enough weight? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> That's the way they have been designed. That's, That's the where they, they come from. <laughs> right. Well, and, and actually being so unique, you know, um, instead of having just a certificate or a degree um, and, and actually having real world, here's a concrete thing that I did. Right. So the industry is evolving to, a, uh, to the point where uh, what matters more is the portfolio of your projects that you have done than the piece of paper or the degree that you have acquired. Most employers care about what you can actually do. Mm -hmm. And the best proof of that is these projects or, you know, your GitHub repositories and so on. Already many of the companies are uh, asking for GitHub repositories rather than your, you know, college transcripts. Mm -hmm. So the world, the professional world is, uh, especially in the tech, is already moving in that direction. Yes, I mean, certainly here in Silicon Valley it's very noticed. I mean, if you go across the, the country or the world, I'm sure that kind of a degree from MIT is worth a lot. And I honestly I wouldn't really recommend anybody to drop in a MIT enrollment purely for another degree at this point, although maybe in a year or two it will. Um, but what is really quite amazing is the velocity at which companies are willing to accept this new credential. It's actually quite amazing. So what Nitin just said is what we hear every single company say. We care about that our people function well in our work environment. And the credential that you might bring from a traditional education institution or from Udacity or anybody else uh, is really just a pointer towards your proficiency. We have the advantage that our and then we, it's built by industry, right? So it's built by the people that might end up hiring you. So we, we believe we are closest to the job that you can possibly be. And as VP of Engineering, I can tell you that for our own hiring, we lay more emphasis on your project portfolio and your GitHub uh, repositories and, your and, uh, and uh, eventually the nano degrees uh, mm -hmm. rather than on the actual degrees or your college transcripts. We don't even ask for college transcripts anymore. Okay, we'd like to see those nano degree candidates coming here to Udacity, absolutely. Um, well, we hired a whole bunch of wrong people. It's quite <laughs> exactly. amazing. Yeah. Um, so, so finally, actually along that line, um, uh, Nitin, uh, someone's kind of asking, what's an example of some of the work going on here at, at Udacity in data science? Great. So uh, the, the cool thing about Udacity is that uh, we have probably one of the richest data sets on how students learn. So we are able to track things like 
when are students struggling through a course? When is it that they pause uh, a, a, a video lecture and uh, rewind and watch the same thing over multiple times? Because that can offer us clues on which parts are tough for students, how we can improve the, uh, the exposition of that topic. We keep track of how much time people take to answer quizzes, uh, how often they get it right, how often they get it wrong, uh, how much time does it take for them to eventually get it right. And these are the kinds of things that give us a very tight feedback loop on how effective our courses are, how effective students are, and in a uh, few, uh, few years, we would be in a position to have uh, very clear, specific intervention and perhaps personalized paths of learning to our students. Yeah, I mean, Nidin kind of tortures us with data regularly and <laughs> says, here's data, guys, look at this, oh my god, about both our content and, and what we offer. But through that process, I can tell you, when we started out these so-called massive open online courses, um, our finishing rates from year to end were like for a single course, like 3%, 5%, at best 10%. And now for our best course, it's north of 90%. Um, and that's really been meticulously looking at like what intervention makes sets of students for success and how can we change the way we do deadlines, the way we do courses, community, um, mentoring that we now offer a lot, and all these things um, to, to make the courses as good as possible. We're, we're thanking them then for strangling us with that data. Of course. <laughs> That's all you hired him for. It's quite amazing. I can tell you, I mean, in education is interesting because education is one of these fields that's kind of a little bit medieval. Um, we have about 1.4 million college professors, and they all have opinions about how to educate. Very few people are afforded the ability to really look at student data in a minute. And that's one of the nice things about us as a company, that we have the data and we're using it. In the traditional uh, campus courses, the professors and the students don't get that data or, or a feedback on what kind of teaching techniques are more effective than the others. Uh, what really contributes to learning? Uh, what aspects of teaching are effective and which are not? And that is the advantage of uh, the online education and online learning platforms that it affords you that capability. And that is honestly one of the reasons why I got excited to university and joined here to, to help change the world of education, to help students learn so much more effectively. Here's your data point, how data, how being a data analyst can make you change the world, right? So this is for education. You can go to any other industry and find the same effects. Uh, fantastic. Well, with that, um, the uh, way data science will power our future is to change the world. Uh, and we're so uh, excited everybody joined us today. Uh, don't forget, uh, if you're interested in uh, joining our data analyst data degree, please visit the link. Um, and uh, we will send you more information uh, launching on Monday. But thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, and stay you dangerous. <laughs>